OTB's The Hurling Pod with James Skell and Paul Murphy. People of Galway, we love you! I don't want to leave the people of Waterford down, you know, because they're my life, you know. People of Waterford are my life, you know, and I, 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 love, I, love, I love my county, you know. We love John Milan. It's almost like they're afraid to kind of mm. go and hurl and yeah. just let themselves express themselves. They're, it's like as if they're nearly afraid to make a mistake and sometimes you have to make a mistake and just throw off that bit of nervousness and have a go. Yeah, it's pure constipated hurling. You are very welcome along to episode four of The Hurling Pod with James Gehill and Paul Murphy. Coming up over the next hour or so on the show, it is the final round of the regular section of the National Hurling League this weekend. Still plenty on the line, including the two semi-final spots in Division 1B. We already know the semi-finalists in Division 1A, but we'll know the composition of the relegation final. Unthinkable that Limerick could possibly be in it, but Limerick have to avoid defeat against Offaly if they're not to face Antrim in the battle to beat the drop into Division 2A for next season. All be it, the games might not go ahead. The GPA currently are in negotiations with the GA and around county boards about uh, pay being restored back to previous levels. And there is the potential hanging over the fixtures this weekend that there could be a player's strike, which would mean that the fixtures would not take place. Tom Brady is back after 40 days in American football. We'll chat to the guys about some U-turns in retirements and potentially U-turns when people get the itch to go back uh, just a few weeks after they've announced their inter-county retirement. Smart slitters are coming in. So the likes of James Gehl will no longer be able to bring a bag of heavy balls to be hit when a 65 is given against their team. They're all going to have to meet a certain standard and we are moving towards the standardization of the slitter, which has been a discussion in the last few years. And the guys are going to pick their top five most valuable hurlers in the game right now. Paul Murphy, James Gell, how are you getting on, lads? Very good, Will. Thank you. Great, now, Will. Lots to start off with. Um, I'll give you a first shout on this one, Paul. The situation around the expenses and the discussion that would have taken place over the last 24 hours as we record the hurling pod now. Uh, Tom Parsons was on League Sunday last night outlining where the GPA's position is on this, where it's kind of twofold, really. On the one hand, it's a case that he made very simply, which was players don't want to be out of pocket for sessions that they have to go to for team preparation for League and Championship. Then it kind of spiraled off into a different direction where there was a bit of a discussion about some county boards being in arrears about payments that are due to be paid and also the rate being discussed at the moment particularly I guess in light of the situation right now where if you go to fill your tank with diesel it's two euro a litre at the moment so understandably players are probably feeling the pinch around that and then it kind of went off into a different discussion entirely when Colin O'Rourke was speaking about potentially capping the amount of sessions so there's a lot to unpack here But on a very simple level to start with here, first, Paul, can you understand why players are taking a stance right now about expenses as we get ready for this weekend? Yeah, absolutely. Um, And and I think, you know, when you look at it, it's across the board. It's not a case that you have people in certain pockets. You know, when you have personnel who have been paid or players who have been paid, but they're standing in solidarity. And we've seen managers as well refusing interviews and stuff. Um, Well, I think that just reflects the strong feeling that's out there at the moment. And, you know, I I would have always said my dynamic when I was playing um, was one of the better ones in terms of making it train and different things. You know, I live in Kilkenny for the majority of my career. I've worked in Kilkenny and Kilkenny is not a big place. You know, it's not like you're talking about going from West Cork into Parky Cueve or whatever to train where it's an enormous journey within the county. I never had that. But even at that, you know, the journey is added up. But we have players who are traveling from and I'll just use Kilkenny, like lads coming from Dublin, lads coming from Cork, lads coming from Limerick. I'm thinking particularly students. And you have students who a huge amount has been asked of them, you know, be it, let's say, Fitzgibbon. And I'll use the students, for example, at the moment. Let's say they're playing Fitzgibbon or they're, they're you know, they're doing whatever they're trying to study, but they're also trying to train inter-county. You know, these people aren't earning a lot of money. And, you know, for a player who's working, they can maybe go a month or two months or three months or whatever without receiving the payments. But... For other lads, it's not as simple as that. And we see at the moment, you know, cost of living, we're all talking about it at the moment. It's 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 front page news the whole time. It's no different for these lads. So I, I completely understand it. And, I, and again, I say that coming from a background of where I wouldn't have ever had to make as long a journeys so consistently as a lot of players. But I do think as well, it's important from the point of view that you don't let it creep. You don't allow yourself to be seen as kind of, I suppose, a soft touch that will let it, will, you know, will let it drift down. Because at the end of the day, remember, these players are generating revenue, you know, so, and they're generating revenue at a very, I suppose, low expense for the GA to pay them. 
So um, like, I do agree with them. I do think that, look, they're just making a, a strong stand at the moment. And I, I understand exactly where it's coming from. I, I think I, I fully support it, um, what they're trying to do, you know. Yeah, because James, I guess things have changed a little bit here because this is all really a negotiation between county boards and panels ultimately because it's county boards who will be paying the expenses mm. at the end of the day in this. But a couple of years ago, the appeal was made by the county boards. It was a difficult time because the pandemic had kicked in. There was no one coming through the gates for club games or for league games at the time and we were facing a championship behind closed doors. So understandably, their income streams were dramatically hit. So therefore, management teams and players took a bit of a financial hit as well when it came to expenses under an agreement. Now the feeling is we're back to a point where we've got full attendances, thankfully, since the start of the league this year. So the money is starting to flow back into county board coffers again. And it seems a basic requirement that the players would not be out of pocket to be preparing for games and, you know, the various different training sessions and whatever else they might have to attend. Yeah, like I, I have to agree with Paul there in that my, my, pre, my personal situation in Galway was always that of a positive one when it came to expenses. Like in all the years I played with them, I can never think of an instance whereby we had to go and request expenses because of delay or go to, if there was a, a low rate being offered, that was always taken care of. So from my position, it was always a positive. So when, when I hear the word strike being thrown about, that screams to me that it's a very, very serious situation. Now, how, how serious? Like, for, as Paul said, for people who are in work uh, in today's world, let's say they can kind of semi-survive. The students, I don't know how they survive because when I was playing... The rates in school in, in college, the, the accommodation uh, costs, the fuel costs, all were way lower than what they are today. So, like students, it's costing them to go training, you know. And I think the least that that can be done or can be offered them is that expenses are paid in a timely manner. And if a strike is being mentioned, then this the situation must be serious, you know. Um, and like it's it's not as if like I know the public will sometimes when when you mention expenses or you mention you know uh, kind of. A tax rebate or you mentioned kind of semi-professional members of the public seem to lose their mind a small bit you know we shouldn't be paying players we need to stick with our amateur ethos we're not questioning that whatsoever like amateur ethos is never questioned it's, it's all we want to do is get paid for the service we're providing let's say expense sorry expense for the service we're providing and as paul says the ga guys football and hurling alike they produce a fantastic product that sells out massive crowds like i remember there was a call when we played paul let's say in the 2012 all ireland like there was like six and a half million generated off the first day and the replay was and it was the first replay that was i think of an Ireland final for a, lo- a long long time anyway and the next the replay didn't generate something like four million you know so that, that them two games like 10 million that, that, that were going off a long way you know, do you know what I mean for covering expenses for counties and ever all across the country for years to come so it's not as if we're pulling out of a, a very very short pocket you know the pockets are there in the GEA so the least that can be done is that they the return the expense rate to what it was pre-COVID and we get on about our business. Yeah, because I think, Paul, yourself and James are probably in a slightly lucky situation where you were involved in panels where these payments didn't become an issue. But I remember a few years back being approached just as a member of the media by the Westmead football panel because they had fallen 15 weeks in arrears at the time and they were trying to put a bit of pressure onto the county board. And, you know, funnily enough, once it became an issue in the local paper and on the radio, next thing a payment plan was found and the 15 weeks arrears were all paid pretty quickly. So I don't think players necessarily want to go in that direction, but it seems the experience seems to vary, uh, Paul, panel to panel, really, when it comes to this as well. Yeah, it does big time. Um, I, I never experienced it. Uh, to be honest, the Kenny County Board would have been the exact opposite. They would have said, listen, lads, get it in there at the end of the month, just because they could stay on top of it, they could keep track of it. And then, as well, just for their own budgeting, really, that they could see, you know, we have X amount of players, this is the general... This is the mean average of what we were paying out. So we never had this. And, you know, I, I always had to create simply for, for, um, for different county panels and different things for different reasons, you know, in terms of there's always some sort of issues every so often might be raised and you'd see it in the media. And like you said, there are the West Mead lads who had to bring it to the media to try and get it sorted. I never had to encounter that. So but, but when you do hear it in other counties, you have great sympathy for that because regardless of what county you're from, you're making the same effort, um, if not more in other counties, because you have to travel a further distance. So you could be working in Galway and you're traveling back to, you know, to Cavan or somewhere, you know, depending on what you're doing. And maybe you're not getting the same limelight as, as, as the Tipperary player or as the Cork player or whatever. So you have to fight that bit harder for it. But you're still spending money on diesel. You're still doing an expense. You're still making the personal commitment. And, you know, the other side of it, to flip around, I don't think anyone is overly arguing that these players don't deserve it. But, you know, the players are... 
getting good crowds into stadiums around the country, you know, in February, in March. They're generating revenue. If you look at Park and Queen last weekend, um, Cork and Galway, you know, 13,000 people, 13,000 people came into the local area, bought food, went in for a few pints, bought a bit of diesel. You know, you can guarantee the local people around those areas are very appreciative of what these players are drawing. Without these players and without the function they're serving, you know, the, the, the local economy in these areas will be suffering a little bit more as well. But I don't think anyone's really arguing that the players don't deserve the expenses. I suppose it's just the fact that they're not being paid as promptly and maybe that's just a poor reflection on certain areas in the GA that it's a, it's a small bit maybe a lack of respect to the players that, look, the money is coming back in now. And okay, everybody went through a hard time. Businesses went through a hard time more than GA. But... Look, the GA should be in a strong enough position to be able to weather these kind of you know rainy days that they're still able to pay out from their players. And again, just a small bit of respect back to the lads who are training the three, four, as we're here maybe five nights a week. You know, this is the, the least we can do for them. Yeah. The other thing as well, James, I think the reason this becomes such a pressing issue, you've got the rise in the cost of living, plus especially the rise of fuel when it comes to these expenses. But also, I think compared to two years ago, there were plenty of players who were no longer having to go to other places to study. And like, primarily, if you think about it, how many people that play Gaelic games right now at inter-county level are students? I would say there's a huge amount across panels. So many of them are now going back to actual in-house lecturing again, as opposed to doing it remotely. So some lads who maybe would have moved back to their county or not had the expense of particularly having to go to the Eastern Seaboard if they were in one of the Dublin colleges and then they're traveling home, that expense has now been added back on as well it's a very different place than when we were the last two years during COVID-19. Yeah, because when COVID happened, uh, I, I was obviously part of Galway and you didn't feel the expense at all because you didn't have to go, you know. So any any runs you were, you were supposed to do or any kind of conditioning sessions was always done effectively in isolation, you know, if you was the pundit say, or out in the backfield. So you had no real, you had no real expense, you know. Maybe the nutrition, but you, you, you were carrying that anyway as a household. Now we're going back to the normal uh, run of middle things where, as you said, well, you're going back to... They're going back to, to work, to school, or they're in a, in a teaching capacity, to college. And like, not every person goes to college in their own county. You know, they, they could go, let's say, 100 or 150 miles away. So you have to factor that in also. So it's a, it's a difficult time, you know, and especially the way inflation is going. I, I understand the importance and, and how, I suppose, the GPA have got to mention the word strike in order to, to I suppose, hammer home the point to the, G, to the GA that this needs to be sorted swiftly. Like, Paul is, Paul is very right. It's only when, I don't know, is it an Irish thing? Is a GA thing. It's only when something gets into the limelight or gets into the public focus and gets on a newspaper or an article or, or on television, it actually becomes relevant. And then, then there's action. So like the, the that's why I find the GA sometimes are in some areas are very reactive as opposed to proactive. So they need something to be nearly publicized in a kind of a semi-negative fashion before they actually act and do something. And that's where we are right now. Like I didn't hear a word about expenses truthfully until probably what a week ago. No, nobody heard about it. So, so it had to be publicized broadcast around the nation, throw out the word strike, and then hopefully there'll be action. So I'd, I'd say what you will see in the next probably two weeks is an awful lot of action from county, respective county boards and the GPA as a whole, and this will get put to bed. I don't think you'll see a strike at all. Yeah, no, I don't think it'll actually get to that, but I think Tom Parsons probably had to put that position out on yeah. League Sunday when there's the mass, massive exposure, which is possible there, so that your position is coming from the strongest point of view, and then probably it scales back from there. Um, yeah. But when it comes to it, Paul, as we look down the line on this, there was obviously the discussion around capping sessions potentially as well. Like in Kilkenny, would you have had many times when you'd have went over three or four sessions a week? Because you see, when Tom Parsons mentioned, I think he said, it, it doesn't matter whether it's one or whether it's five, the discussion then came to why isn't it capped to three sessions? Sessions a week. Would there have been many times in your preparations, like both of you lads have been involved in All Ireland winning campaigns, that you would have went over three sessions on a given week? Uh, not for me, anyway. No, um, you know, very rarely. I, I can't even think of an example actually where we went over three sessions. Um, the only one I would say would be, for example, you know, you might have played a match on a Sunday. There's a quick turnaround, maybe two weeks, and they want to just get you back in of a Monday night, and we just meet in Owen Park and watch back a video, a few statistics. Just to get it back into lads' heads and reinforce it before we go back training on Wednesday or night or Friday night. But you know, like you know, Brian's ethos was really around we come together uh maybe three days a week. You know, you have your gym sessions, you have your running or whatever, let's say if it's if it's a little bit into the pre-season, but we're not asking a huge amount of you in, in that way. You know, you can have no complaints that there's a nice little balance here, and there was a balance, but the way that was paid back was in um 
you know, the buy-in from the players. And I'm not talking monetary, you know, I'm talking that the players were going, you know, I'm, I'm training three days a week. As an inter-county player, generally the reason you're there is because you do more than you were always ever asked to do anyway. That's why you make inter-county because you always were willing to train a little bit away from the pitch. So when you have to do your gym session or your ball alley, that's no problem. You were always doing that anyway. So you'd go and do your few bits. But, you know, players were in a good mind space at that stage then that, you know, you weren't overworked. You weren't thinking, you know, how am I expected to juggle work and train five nights this week? I can't do it. And then you're kind of, you're, you're stressing over. We were never asked that, you know. Um, so from that's from, from a work point of view, which is always probably the main thing. Of, sorry, I suppose family as well, but trying to manage work and fitting that into training. If you had to move, for example, I do 24-hour duties. If I had to move 24-hour duty from a Tuesday to a Wednesday, that was never a big thing. But if I'm training Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, suddenly the window for me to move that 24-hour duty. And like lads who are guards are the same thing, or lads who might be a doctor, or, and they're doing shift work. It, was, it would be very hard to try and move that if you're training five nights a week. So it was very easy for me, and from my experience with Kilkenny, we never, to my recollection, went over three nights um, a week. So again, it is interesting that this conversation is brought up. Is there other counties collectively going five nights a week? If you are, you know, I think there's a lot of lads who argue that's overkill. Um, and, and the question is to be raised as to why are you doing it? Are you doing it to maybe keep lads, keep an eye on lads that if you have them five nights a week, they're under the microscope and they can't do a whole lot? Are you doing it because you want to do, let's say, three field sessions, but you want their gym sessions to be collective? Is that the reason? And, and like, you know, and what's the reason for that? Is it because you feel you're getting more out of them if you bring them in a gym and you're watching them? So if there are counties doing it, I can say, I don't know what that experience is like because our, I suppose, focus was collectively we'll do three nights. You have your work to do off the pitch then. If you do it, you know, we'll see it in the pitch. If you're not doing it, we'll ask the question as to why you're not doing it. But I, I couldn't say that we ever did that. James, I don't know if cap and sessions would work anyway, because if we take times where there were, say, enforced caps on when training could take place, I'm thinking back, remember when April was made a sacrosanct month a couple of years ago and still teams got caught going on training camps during April when players are meant to be released back to the club. I think back to COVID-19 when collective sessions in, you know, bigger than the pods that were allowed weren't due to take place. And mm -hmm. next thing, there's a long lens going to a training session near Dublin Airport and the Dublin footballers are having a collective session. We had similar problems with the down footballers and the Cork footballers at the time as well. The truth of it is, I think if you try and cap it, there'll be a paranoia among certain counties and among certain managers that the Joneses up the road are doing one or two more sessions than us. So therefore, we have to do something to compete with them. Absolutely. And again, I'll, I'll say it again. I think it's an Irish thing. I think it's an Irish GEA thing. You know, I think the COVID one was kind of serious because that, that had obviously a medical background. So that, that had repercussions, you know, and that was that was put in for the interest of everybody. Um, so that was going to be respected. And I suppose the people who were caught, let's, let's call it spaded fade caught, the sanctions were a lot more serious. But you go back a few years ago and think about the November, December training ban. Well, the so-called training ban that was broken religiously. You know, everyone... I, Everybody broke that, you know, whether that was just uh, they broke it on a regular basis, three, four times a week, or they broke it once. It didn't matter. They still broke it. And the sanctions were irrelevant. The, there was calls at the time to, to throw them out, throw teams out of the league. There was one county just south of me, just right, right south of me that, that got caught, let's say, and uh, there was no sanctions. There was mentions about being thrown out of the league or banning players ban or banning management. It never happened. So if there was no repercussion. It's just going to happen again. And then I know if you're looking at a team, and it happened up here where we're looking down at the team down south and you're going, sure, if they're at it, we're going to do it. You know, if nothing happens to them, we're going to do it. And, uh, you know, it's monkey see, monkey do in that instance. And, but Paul, Paul is dead right. Like, we'd be very much the same as Paul in the sense that what more do you need to do in three sessions? You know, like, when you consider December, January, February, you know, you're probably in the, in the midst of your strength and conditioning sessions, any more than that like, will result in probably an injury, especially for, for an amateur player who hasn't got the recovery time of a Ronaldo to go home and hop into his jacuzzi and take the morning off. You know, we, we don't have that luxury, so we can go up and go to work. So the, 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 the chances of increasing injury is huge when you go from three to four to five sessions because there's no recovery time. Us as an amateur athlete, we just don't have it. You know, like the human body is not made for stress. It's not meant for sport. That's why we break down and get injured. So the more you work it, the more you get injured. So three days is more than sufficient. And like what Paul was saying there about the, like the S&C, in terms of private gym sessions or foam rolling or whether it be a recovery session, nutrition, all that stuff, analysis, that can all be done by yourself. There's no reason why you should be collectively collecting meetings. The only time I remember going in, doing a collective gym session was probably the introduction of a new program. 
where you'd be let off then for six weeks. You know what I mean? And, and then otherwise, then you'd be just training three nights. And then you'd have the odd occasion, like we spoke before about if you had a training camp where you do Friday, Saturday, Sunday. That was just an irregularity that you have more uh, from a bonding perspective as opposed to actually a workload perspective. That was just to get the group together, get you uh, in around each other for, for a couple of days to, in, a, in a different setting, away from families and kids and all that kind of jazz and just kind of, you know, relaxing each other's company. So I, I would definitely champion that kind of collective, you know, three sessions collectively in a week. But otherwise, I, there's there's a point, I don't know, would you, would you ban it? You know, that's, that's a bit heavy, you know what I mean? But logically speaking, I do think as well, you'd see it more, if I'm honest, you'd see more in football teams than you would in hurling teams. As football teams, let's be frank about it, they're far more S&C based than they're, I'm going to say it out loud, skill based. Hurling's an awful lot of skill based. So let's say you have to work a lot more technically. So that's why I think you might see more repetition from a football perspective in Ireland. Will that change over time though, Paul, when you consider as the story has been told about this great Limerick team of recent years, so much of it is spoken about you know, the change in their physical conditioning from when that group was kind of coming together and from a very young age, they were very targeted in trying to put on lean muscle and you know, change the approach in Limerick about uh, physical conditioning. Everyone kind of copies the team who's ahead. Is there a possibility that strength and conditioning within hurling might actually move more towards in exactly the football direction that James was just mentioning there? I, to be honest, I think all these things go on cycles. Um, like I've, I, I've seen so many of these things before. Like if you go back, when I started my my career, let's say around 2011, and let's say it was the Kennys and the Tips and Galways were playing each other. You had lads, they were all talking about how big these were, these lads were, how hard they were hitting, you know, the muscle mass they were carrying and different things. And then suddenly Claire came along in 2013 and people thought Claire after rewriting the book that this it's, it's all about fast players moving the ball quickly, running the ball, running the ball up the pitch. You need lads covering 11, 12, 13 kilometers, and people thought, this is it. This is it done now. This is the way all that big carrying muscle around the pitch, it's gone. And then suddenly it slowly starts creeping back the other direction. So I just think these things, as part of we talk about how do you beat Limerick, let's say, for example, at the moment, people talk about how do you beat Limerick. Well, whatever solution comes along that will successfully beat Limerick um, long term, and let's say a new team come on top. Well, people will look at that new team and go, well, what they're doing now, that is the way, that's that's the new game, and this won't be beaten. And another team will come along and beat them, and whatever the makeup of that team is, people will go, that's what it is. But the funny thing is, when you're winning, people look at what you do, and it gets a, it gets a small bit heightened in terms of, and, 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 and tales get added on to it, and stories become mad. Like, I remember when Donegal won the football at Ireland, he won it the same year, and there was talk that there was lads eating eight dinners a day. I remember this one that was, was mad. They're saying there's lads, this lad's eating eight dinners. He's huge and he runs X amount and he burns this amount of calories. And Jim McGuinness came out and said, "Look, that isn't true. Uh, that doesn't happen. Maybe this is just part of winning the you know stories, gather legs and things like that." There's no doubt the Limerick lads are carrying huge muscle. And I say the Limerick lads, and you think of Dan Morrissey's and, and Tom Morrissey's and Daryl Hegarty's. But make no doubt about it, those lads cannot put on that muscle. And we're getting into it now without recovering, without taking days off where the body recovers. Because if they're going into a gym, let's say, on Monday evening, and Dan Morrissey, for example, I'll use him because he's a big lump of a lad, he goes in and lifts all the way under the sun. He can't do that Tuesday. He can't go in there without breaking down on Tuesday. So he has to take recovery. So if anyone says that, let's say, Sean Finn or Garold Hegarty or whatever, it's going in seven days a week into the gym. Well, he can go in seven days a week into the gym, but he's only going hard maybe three days a week because you physically cannot do what... You're like, what, what, what people think you can do in a gym. You're human. You can't do that. So I would say if, if people, unless you're in the situation, unless you're in the Limerick camp, you know what Limerick are doing. Or maybe you're once removed, that you're a girlfriend or, or whatever it may be, or one of the Limerick lads, you'll understand what they're doing. I think if you're outside of that, you're probably going to hear legs gathered on it. Certainly people are trying to replicate what Limerick are trying to do. But I often think that, you know, people aim to try and, let's say, replicate Limerick, that what they are doing, that's what we should be doing. And Limerick are training five nights a week, but we'll train six nights a week. And like James was saying, it's an Irish thing. Oh, Limerick are back in December. We'll go back in November next year, and that's how we beat Limerick. It's not how you beat them. Um, and I, I'm just using Limerick as the example. To be honest, like, regardless what system people come up with in terms of moving forward in the GA, if we're sticking with the whole thing of how many days a week you should be working, I don't think you can change it. My belief would be if I was going over a team tomorrow, that I'm not going to bring this team out five nights a week. I'm going to come collectively three nights a week. And if, if whatever work I feel they need to do away from the pitch, happy days. But I feel you can get a team to the Limerick standard by keeping that template, not by trying to outwork them in terms of, 
oh, she's left to do six nights a week in the gym. No, not by trying to do that because what you'll find then is lads will burn out. They won't be able to sustain it. And at the end of the day, to achieve a place like that, you need to have a plan that's sustainable. Six nights a week or whatever it is, is not sustainable. And just to park, to finish this one off and park it and move on to the games this weekend, James, I was just thinking when you look at a lot of the successful teams, there's very few professional teams that are training as intensely as some Gaelic Games teams train. And then you look at the successful teams in GA of recent years. You look at Limerick last year who kind of found their way into the league and then got their form right for Munster Championship and the All-Ireland Championship itself. Similarly, the Tyrone footballers are not concerned by the fact they've had a slow start to this year on the back of a very difficult year last year. Dublin often tapered their seasons coming in off the start of the league and it was never really a massive priority. It was about peaking later on in the season. If the top teams are able to do that, those teams who are overloading their work should surely be looking at the example of what the top teams are doing rather than trying to make it an arms race and do more than them. Yeah, you're right. They probably should, you know, like if there's a formula being presented by a top team for that, that breeds success, you'd say, why doesn't everybody else copy that? But again, I, I know I, I repeat it and it sounds overly repetitive. There's, it's an Irish thing, like we have to do more than them, you know. Like there's so many people in GA circles think that's the answer. Like I've seen so many club club, club people, let's say, around Galway and other places where they think we have to run more and train harder and train longer, do you know what I mean? Because up the road, other crowds, well, we'll be training harder than them. You know, do you know what I mean? I don't know. Is it, is it a psyche issue? I, and I, I just think it probably is a lack of probably knowledge, training, professionalism in GEA people that we think we always do more. But I think the way the game is evolving now over the last, really, it feels like over the last two years, you know, three years, there's more science put into it, you know, specifically around the body and recovery and how you actually maximize your performance as opposed to anything else. And like, and like Paul will tell you, everyone will tell you, like, gym work is important, training is important. You know, working hard, when you're working hard is very important, but then the downtime, the rest time, whether well, that's physical or mental, they both carry equal importance. You know, the players need to shut off entirely. Just stay at home or walk the farm, you know what I mean? Every now and then, it's every kind of two, three times a week, just to break away, branch away from the GA, because at the end of the day, it's not our profession, it's not our, it's not our livelihood. It doesn't provide anything but probably a source of enjoyment for ourselves, playing as the people watching it. So don't let it consume you. But some players get bloody well consumed you know I've seen players in Galway who by they have all the ability in the world but they get just so consumed by the whole thing that they're overworking themselves injured then they're gone you know then they break down and so on and then their career never never actually takes a, uh, you know, the passion that they wanted to so I, I see I, I, the teams I had now as we're, as we're speaking you know there's probably teams training right now at five o'clock as we speak you know what I mean because they think they need to do more than than Tyrone last year and need to do more than Limerick and it's just, it's just not the answer. It's not the answer, do you know what I mean? But until more knowledge, and as I said, training, and, and I suppose ac- ac- academics come into it, teams are going to keep adopting that head- attitude for years to come. Yeah. And look, hopefully the experience of the last couple of years will have taught a few lessons as well around maybe some of the analysis can be done remotely, and it doesn't mean having to drag everyone across to actually be in the same room for that. And the likes of Zoom have been you know, possible and all sorts of different tracker systems that people can use for what the rest of the Will it like, like, I remember going through it the start of COVID and one of my good friends said to me, oh, this is great now. This will teach people to slow down and because mm. everyone was going so fast, fast, fast. And I can tell you, we're right back where we started, you know, <laughs> the, the pace of life. You know, but will it, you know, you, you think that now, you think Zoom is a great tool. We never had mm. it. But I guarantee you, managers would, lo- would love to be looking at players in front of them as opposed to on a screen. And look, managers will make the argument yeah. that it's, it's much easier to keep people's attention better and it's better to have everyone in the room for the bonding and for the chat and all that kind of stuff as well. Maybe I'm being totally naive when I say that actually they might be able to do things more remotely, Paul. I think you are, Will, to be honest. Like, you know, I <laughs> like, no, I, I, I do, I'd agree. I agree with James there. Like a lot of this stuff, um, for people who wouldn't know, it is available. Like there's, there's loads of different apps and we would have always had the information at our fingertips. And for anyone who wanted it, like I was always really interested in it. You get your GPS information back that night after training, if not the following morning, it's uploaded. So you can see your heat map. You can see how many times you did a burst in training over what your, let's say, your speed over meter over 10 meters was. All these different things. That information is there. There's players being given videos of, let's say, you play a game. All your clips will be sent to you uh, the following day. You can click into other players' clips. You can click into the opposition. All that information is there. Um and like again, the way we would have used it would have been that information is given to you. Look at it, and then when we come to train, and you know, if you have any points, bring it to training, or if we have a little meeting, which I found that short meetings, which is great because lads would come and say, "Listen, I saw this," and it's it's, it's a very productive thing to do. But I do agree with James. Um, it, it, it's personality driven in terms of a manager. If a manager says, "I know, I want to bring everyone together," 
and I want to see lads, you know, I want to look them in the eye and tell them this sort of stuff. There's functionality for that. It's very hard sometimes to sit on a Zoom with, with 40 lads and you're telling lads to turn off their microphones and, you know, all this sort of crack. It can be very distracting to do that. So sometimes there is the use for a meeting, but a lot of this stuff, when it is statistics, look, we're living in the age of the smartphone. It can all be just arrive on your smartphone by email, by an app that evening. And yeah, if you want to have your meeting, let's say lads, we're training at seven, in there for six o'clock, we're having a quick 15 minute meeting to bring that out into the pitch. Happy days. But I do agree with James, you still have your lads who go, not lads, we're sitting down there now and we're going to have an hour, an hour and a half of a meeting. So I think there's somewhere in the middle, there's an element of truth there. Yeah, but look, maybe just that kind of personal contact is important as well. It's probably horrible after two years and not been able to meet up collectively to be able to actually do it properly now again. Let's have a look at this weekend then. And I'll give you a first shout, Paul, because your county are involved in the game that's the gatekeeper really for the semi-finals from Group 1B of Division 1. How are you feeling about Kilkenny taking on Waterford this weekend? Bearing in mind, the last few weeks we've been talking in such glowing terms about how impressive Waterford have been, the depth of their panel, how well-conditioned they look. It's going to be a hell of a challenge for Kilkenny and Olin Park this weekend. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, and when we see what Waterford are bringing, we talked about last week of just the depth of their panel and um, where they seem to be in every area of their game, be it, you know, the physical skill part of the game, fitness-wise, they just seem to be in a really good place, but also just the mentality of the whole panel. They seem to be forged really well together at the moment. Um, and it doesn't seem to matter what 15 Ian Cal puts out. They just hit the ground running and they're going at you, going at you. Um, yeah, for me, at the moment, they're they're the toughest team between them and Wexford at the moment. But I just think there's something about Waterford at the moment that they're the real, um, I suppose, benchmark at the moment of if you can go 70 minutes towards to Waterford with the Ballygunner lads back. I know Dublin played them at the start of the league and, again, draw a game, great match. But, like, you know, Waterford had their few lads to come back at that stage. It's a tough game for Kilkenny, but I think Kilkenny are in a good place now to play them because... You know, they've, they've, they've had their few games. Okay, they've had their few big wins um, bet by Tipperary, but then went out on an absolutely savage performance against Dublin. Um, I think, you know, the one thing I'll always stand over with a Kilkenny team with Brian Cody is that he'll have them in a place where they relish the challenge. One thing that you hate seeing in your own county team going out is that they miss an opportunity to maybe test their mental against a good team. Brian will, will love this channel, challenge. And also what Brian won't be afraid to do is he might, not to say he won't put out his strongest 15, he will put out a very strong 15, but he won't be afraid to try, let's say your Tom Feelings, okay, Tom Feelings might have an injury this weekend, but like, he won't be afraid of, you know, Blanchfield going out there wing back because Blanchfield has gone up against Danny Sutcliffe and proven himself. He won't be afraid either to maybe throw in a fella that maybe featured early on the league, hasn't seen a few games, and you know what, we'll put him back in there now. So, like, it, it's a great challenge for Kenny. I think where Watford are at the moment they might have a small bit too much for them. Just in terms of, look, we're talking about where, where teams are at at the moment. And different teams are currently at different stages of the process at the moment. I just think Watford are really gunning at the moment for, I don't think necessarily, they want a bit of silverware. Um, they're looking to maybe go into Munster. Munster is more important to them now at the moment than the league. But I think the momentum they have, it's just going to carry them into a league final and potentially win a league. I just That's where I see Watford at the moment. So, I do think I see Kilkenny taking a lot from this match, and I wouldn't be surprised if Kilkenny came out with a victory in Northern Park. You know, we didn't expect the, the performance from Kilkenny last weekend against Dublin. We didn't expect it to beat Dublin by so much either. But I don't think Watford will roll over as easy as Dublin did last weekend. So, to be honest, look, I'm expecting a great game. I think it's going to be the biggest challenge, no doubt, Kilkenny have had so far in the league. Um, I do see Watford maybe pipping it by a few points, just considering where Watford are at the moment, and that's no slight on Kilkenny. But I just think, look, Watford are really going well at the moment. And I do think they have their eye on a bit of silverware for this league uh, with a quick turnaround. And I think they're the best position as well. We're talking about teams who can actually go win a league and turn around quickly into their provincial championship. I think Watford are, in, are, are the team best poised to go and do that at the moment. So, look, ahead of the weekend, it's a great it's a great chance for Kilkenny to go and test their mettle. Um, and I think Watford, likewise, will enjoy coming to Kilkenny going, we're in a good place to go and visit Kilkenny and do something that a lot of Watford teams haven't done. Not to say they haven't done it, but go and do what a lot of Watford teams have maybe struggled to do over the years and put a win down against Kilkenny in Nolan Park. But I wouldn't rule out Kilkenny victory in it either. That's the thing, James. This is a possibility for Waterford to send out another statement after what they did to Tipperary just before the break. In all 
reality with Waterford's position with scoring difference and the points they already have on the board they're already really well set up to get to the semi-final anyway but you're going out there to try and get a win against your rivals ahead of going into a league semi-final it's a big opportunity for Waterford here it is yeah <clears throat> and I you know when you've got a good thing going you want to keep it going so that I don't think uh Ian Caha will 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 introduce like a team that is is full of youngsters or guys who haven't featured a lot in the league because it might potentially break momentum it could it could look it could work the opposite way too they could win the game with youngsters and then it got a nice squad entirely, but I think he'll, he'll throw out a good squad, a good team, strong team. Um, he'll probably try to introduce the belly gunner lads a bit more than what they've been over the last kind of fortnight and uh, then get themselves into a semi final and move on from there. But again, I'm reiterating what I said last week. I like them, I like what they're about. Um, they're, they're going to Northern Park, which is, again, as we all know, is a tough ground to go to. And uh, they'll take a Kenyan team that'll give them nothing. They won't give them space. Uh, Waterford have built their game plan or built their game really. They've kind of built their whole, their whole persona seems to be about a real high intense work ethic in the middle third and tackling hard and turning over and, and everyone flying towards the goal at the same time. And I'm just interested to see how Kilkenny, who historically would be, for me, the, the hardest working team, the hardest working county in, in, in both sports is Kilkenny Hurlers. You know, that's just that's, that's my opinion. And I think that no matter what team Kilkenny put out, whether it's their strongest 15 or their, their, their middle 15 or whatever, you'll always get the same level of effort from the Kilkenny players than you will from any other county, I see. So I'm interested to see how they they adopt to the Waterford kind of games, the, the game plan, and how they then go go and attack them. And I think if they go attack them well, and, and let's say can you win the game, it may offer a blueprint to how you take on Waterford. You know, it's just that's the way these these league games seem to seem to turn things turn things out. Like like no more than the as we said last week, the clear the way the clear set up on, on the set pieces against Limerick on their hook out again potentially offer a blueprint. So again, a good a good round of league games. Some may say the dead rubbers, but you know beyond a lot of the teams this weekend. Uh, beyond this weekend, they've only got four weeks of preparation left. So I think you'll see a lot of, of the top guys being introduced to get one final game into them before they start into their championship preparation. Well, one of the things, James, that might make this a little bit more significant when it comes particularly to this game this weekend, if you're not playing against a team who are in your own province, you're maybe not giving away your hand quite as much. So there's been a bit of shadow boxing in some of the games where teams knew, a bit like Tip and Waterford last week, where they knew they're meeting early doors in the Munster Championship. So therefore, there's a month away from when you meet. And you don't want to maybe give away everything tactically. In this yeah. case, if you're playing a team who's on the opposite provincial side, you won't meet at least before an All Ireland quarter final. So why not if you're Kilkenny and Waterford go and have a right go at each other this weekend? Yeah, go ahead. I think the only teams that are probably like Leash are playing Dublin at home this this weekend, and I think they're drawn first for the first round of the Leinster Championship. But there may be an element of shadow boxing there, you know. But Dublin still have a chance to qualify. So Dublin are going to put out a strong team and try and take care of Leash as well. So you're right. Um, like I think if 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 for example Galway were playing Wexford this weekend, you'd see a much different kind of setup because Galway are playing Wexford in the championship in five weeks, four and a half weeks. So it's hard to know what'll happen. But again, as I said a minute ago, there's only four weeks in championship. It's their last genuine opportunity to get some game time and top level game time into their players. You can be sure there'll be definitely no challenge games between now and the first round of championship. Just for the run of obviously there's no time, the risk of injury, preparation, etc. So this is the last game beyond that of in-house games where they play their A versus B that they're going to see A, what players are made of. So if there's guys on, on the fringes of squads or on the fringes, fringes of teams even, what they're made of and B, if you've got players, good players, quality players that you need to get game time into and get fitness levels back up and sharpness, this is the time to do it. So you're going to see a kind of, kind of across the board, I believe, even the Galway clear game, essentially dead rubber. It's, you're only playing for position really. Who's going to finish third or fourth? You, you'll, you'll see two good teams go at it because both teams have something to play for. Clare are coming off the back of a good result, you could say against Limerick at home. Galway coming off the back of a bad result. So they all want to kind of, Clare want to keep going and Galway want to correct. So it's the same with Kenny Waterford. Both teams coming off two good results. So they want to keep them going and keep moving forward with a victory. That's why you'll probably see good, good strong teams across the board. Yeah. When it comes to those other two games in Division 1B then, Paul, like in many ways the equation is simple. Dublin and Tipperary need to win if they're going to put the pressure on whoever loses between Waterford and Kenny victories or what are required. The motivation is interesting, though, when it comes to that Leash-Dublin game because Leash have won the important game. Antrim, when they go into the Tipperary game, no, they're already preparing for a relegation final. Yeah. So if you're Antrim, you probably want to make sure you're in the best place possible for playing Offaly or Limerick. And in Leash's case, you don't want to take a heavy defeat against Dublin to spoil your work from the league before you get ready for the championship in a few weeks' time. Yeah, the, the, the dynamics are just funny. It's not as cut and dry as, you know, first may seem. Or, or It's funny how the dynamic just changes as well over the course of the league. And, you know, like you said, last weekend, before the matches were played last weekend, um, you couldn't have predicted, let's say, that we'd sit in here. Not that there's a huge amount on the line, but just that you're trying to figure out what are teams thinking at the moment? What were they trying to prepare? Because... You know, championship just around the corner. 
you know, each team are completely in a different scenario. If you're looking at the likes of, and, and just to jump to Division 1A, for example, like Limerick, John Kiley just came out and said, we're focused on championships. So most likely he's going to go out and throw out a team of, of younger lads, maybe pull back the Tom Morrissey's and, and the Grohl Hegarty's and throw out a few different lads. But then you look at the likes of, let's say, Wexford and Cork. Like Wexford and Cork have been the two kind of big performers, really, in the league. Um, what are they going to go out and do? They're not going to meet each other. But at the same time, do they want to test their mental against each other? One team could decide we're going to go out here now. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking probably more so towards Wexford. They're probably going to go out and say, let's keep this going. Where Cork might go, uh, we'll see about this now. We might pull it back a small bit. So the dynamics are funny. But yeah, if you look at the ones in 1B, um, you know, with Tipperary and Antrim, like Antrim will be smarting after the last day, after the each match going right. We're going into relegation here now. Um, we're playing Tipperary, and, and and the funny thing is about it, as good as they perform, it doesn't change any scenario. So it's a kind of a tough match to play that way, but you can take a few things from it. But the funny thing with Leash in Dublin then is that, you know, Leash could go out and off the back of the feel-good factor in the camp after the win last weekend, we could make it life really hard for Dublin. And Dublin performed really well in the league. But after last weekend now, there might be an air of, you know, uncertainty in the camp of, well, you know, we, we were deploying Paddy Smith as a sweeper, that didn't work, and it, it actually completely came undone last weekend. So they're going down to Leash, and if Leash performed the same way they performed against Antrim, and let alone with 14 men, if they performed that way at 15, it could be a huge victory for Leash. So the dynamic in each camp, it, it, it's funny, and you could see some, you know, you, you could see some really dead games where there's no point in even tuning into it, if we're being really honest, if, across the 1B and 1A. But there could be ones that are, you know, there's a bit of cut to it, and there's a bit of excitement to it, because just... It's two different teams meeting at very strange times for two different teams, you know. And I'm thinking particularly Leash and Dublin. Leash are kind of in the field good place. Dublin, the jury is out again on Dublin because we don't know what the story is. And again, Leash have had a very famous big win over Dublin in Leash not too long ago. So uh, out of all of them, I'd say that could be one where you could see a bit of cut to the Leash and Dublin one. And um, again, we know for Kenny Morford, like we're expecting a good match there. Tipperary and Antrim again. What Tipperary will go out, um, what what dynamic will they be looking? You know, it, 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 it's it's going to be a hard one to call, but I wouldn't write off Leash in that match because I just think where they are, they could go out and put in a really savage performance against Dublin. And if they did, it's not really a good place for Dublin going into the championship. Um, maybe adding another small bit of air of uh, uncertainty among among the panel. Mm. Clare have been improving, James. When we look at the goal, you've already mentioned uh, the goal with Clare game this weekend and what both teams might be looking for. But, you know, Clare got their win against Offaly, which was going to ensure they were in Division 1, which is the most important result. And then they backed that up where they probably should have beaten Limerick uh, just before the break, but got a draw. Three points on the board going into this game against Galway. What are you hoping to see from Galway against Clare at Pierce Stadium on Sunday afternoon? Um, I, I personally would like just to see more energy, you know. Um, like I suppose when I witnessed the Wexford game, that was one thing that just kind of stood out to me that the, there was kind of a lack of it seemed to like a lack of energy, a lack of pace, penetration, you know, a real, a real buzz about the team, and it just it tells you like that they they weren't really flying. Obviously, they were trying things, trying guys in different positions like you have to do in the league, but kind of we're getting to the stage now where we've got to the stage, should I say, whereby it's time to put our ducks in a row a bit, you know. So I just I want to see a victory first and foremost, and you'd like to see. Brian can get back in, let's say, after injury and get back into a bit of game time. You'd like to see Carl Manning around the middle of the park, kind of creating and dominating the game as opposed to being in the half in the full forward line, but and, and kind of a bit of a bit of flipping energy. That's what you want to see. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can summarize it in one word: energy. Just pure energy. And I'd like to see them tackle clear fierce hard and put their big players under pressure. So like John Connell will probably be at, at six again, which is which was probably a great move from where he he was, let's say, at the start of the year. And Tony Kelly's obviously back in good form. So put those two guys under pressure. Simple as that. Put Eva Quilligan under fierce pressure under, under the puck outs and their two energy players in the middle of the park, McInerney and Malone. Hit them and put them under pressure, you know. And like and flip the coin in and saying, what, what do you expect from Clare? You want continuity as a Clare supporter. You want to see them, you know, they've got, they did what they were supposed to do against Offaly. They probably, realistically speaking, in, in my opinion, they probably exceeded themselves a small bit against Limerick and should have seen off the game somewhat. They should have, I suppose, they had a couple of opportunities at the end, so probably supporters are going home somewhat content that they drew at Limerick, but also disappointed they didn't beat them. So you want to see continuity from their perspective that they can back up that performance, uh, both physically, because they, they put it up to Limerick, and tactically, you know, whereby they shut them down in some of their strongest areas and and go into the game with, with, uh, against Galway with a bit of confidence. So I think both teams, as I said to you earlier, will, they're coming at it from different angles. They probably have the same thing in mind where they, they, they both want a result. 
They both want to get extra minutes into players and they uh, they want to finish finish their league campaign, which is exactly what they're doing on a positive. Yeah, because I'd imagine, James, how we judge Galway across this league is somewhat determined by what happens in this game as well. Because, you know, obviously there was a lot of happiness within Galway supporters with how they performed in the first two games. But if it's two wins and then followed up by three defeats, it kind of feels a very middling campaign. While if they win this last game, they go in with a bit of confidence into championship. Yeah, because I... The two ways to look at this now, so for, 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 for me, I'm looking at it, obviously, from the supporter perspective, you'd be disappointed that we've lost two in a row, um, and you'd be hoping we don't lose a third and finish the league, league on a pure downer, you know, but then you're looking at the players' perspective, and you're saying, you, you, you just know, you, you know in the back of your mind, there's a bit of trial, there's a bit of, you know, you're trying out guys, you're trying new systems, uh, new formations, and all that. All that puts all the shit to bed. <laughs> you know what I mean? So all all the issues that potentially, um, I suppose, presented themselves, and all the negatives around the Cork game, and as I said, the energy of the extra game. That's just done. If you finish on, against the, in the clear game with a victory, you just park it, move on, and you, you, you head on to championship on a positive note. Um, flip the kind of game as I said, and if you finish on a negative, you begin to start questioning yourself a small bit. You know, um, but it probably it'll it'll Keep the whoever kind of finishes the league campaign on, on, I suppose, not the way they want to do it. Obviously, through qualifying the semi-finals, will be well aware that they need to improve into in championship. And that's what you have to do. If you look at Galway's case last year, whereby they finished the league, they were giant winners with Kenny, I believe, yeah, after the group stages, and they finished on a real positive. You know, and maybe a degree complacency came in going to the Dublin game. Maybe you know. Whereas that's the opposite this year. So the, every every team has to improve. It has to, and, ha, and like your your last result in the league won't determine your efforts for the championship, obviously. But it'll definitely pick, focus the mindset of the players. Paul, it's unthinkable that Limerick would lose at home to Offaly in their last game and end up in the relegation playoff, irrespective of what team they put out, isn't it? Yeah. Look again, it's no slight on Offaly at the moment, but I just I just don't see it happening just by virtue. I just think Limerick have a bit more hurling regardless of what team they put out. Um, again, that's no offense. That's, that's no offense. I, I don't mean to cause any offense to Offaly, but I just, you know, I know we're saying Limerick have their one or two problems at the moment, but um, I don't see it happening where Offaly are going to turn up and turn over Limerick uh, in their back garden. I just, I don't see it. So like, you know, okay, there's no alarm bells ringing. Um, I think the more points we'd be saying is that if Limerick went out tomorrow morning and played, uh, played Walford, uh, or played Galway or whatever. Well, there's there's questions to be answered there, and you know it's not the same Limerick we were looking at last September or whatever. So, but no, against Offaly, we're not expecting Offaly to come and and turn over Limerick. Um, if we were talking with his guys, oh, if we're talking with Antrim, let's say this time last year, where Antrim were were turning over teams, you know, and and Limerick were in the same situation as they are now, you might be saying, well, you know, you wouldn't rule it out. But Offaly haven't shown us anything to say that. And they're going to go down and get a huge result down the Gaelic grounds. One thing that surprised me slightly, I was looking at the Wikipedia last night to look at the scorers in the league so far this year. Owen Cahill, who's missed one of Offaly's games as well, is actually the top scorer in the league right now, uh, largely down to his freeze. So maybe that says a lot about Offaly not getting enough scores from play so far, the fact that he's up there. And there's no Limerick player in the top five in Division 1A, uh, which possibly says a little bit about their scoring rate, which we talked about last week, where they've only been hitting 16 points a game up until now. They'll probably change that around, you would think, for this weekend, though. Um, just a reminder of the fixtures for this weekend, then. On Saturday, you've got one game in Division 2A, which is down against Kerry at Ballycran, 2 p.m. start. If down lose, they go into the final, which is a very bizarre scenario because Westmead can't get ahead of them. Uh, but they can pretty much decide who they play in the final, effectively, um, depending on what happens against Kerry. A Kerry win plays Westmead back into it, potentially, on Sunday when they play against Kildare. But realistically, the Division 2A final is going to be down against Kerry. In Group 1B of Division 1 on Sunday, you've got Clare against Galway at Pierce Stadium. All these games at 145. Limerick play awfully at the Gaelic grounds, and you've got Wexford against Cork at Wexford Park. In 1B, the really important one is Kilkenny against Waterford in Nolan Park and then Dublin and Tipperary have to do their part if they're going to make a fight for the semi-finals Dublin are away to leash and Tipperary will host Antrim who are managed by their former goalkeeper Darren Gleeson as well the other games which are in Division 2A on Sunday Kildare against Westmead's a half 12 start at Newbridge Mead against Carlo Park Talton at half past 12 and really there's implications at the bottom of the table for both Mead and Kildare in that one as well but it just goes to show that the fixtures aren't all that important in 2A with the table because they're able to split them across two days that's why we've got 145 starts on Sunday now James I know you're a big fan of NFL and uh, I feel really bad for the guy who bought 
the ball that was the last ever touchdown throw from Tom yeah. Brady, and he paid fifty thousand dollars for it yesterday, and then Tom Brady came out of retirement last night. Five, and another zero to that. Was no, sorry, it's five five hundred thousand, even worse. Five hundred and eighteen thousand dollars. It's probably worth yeah. around fifty thousand dollars now. Um, yeah. It's gone worse than NFTs. The amount of value that dropped off on that one pretty quickly. Talk about well, it. If, if he had five hundred thousand to spend on it, so I don't think he's too <laughs> stuck for it. So I'd nah. say he bust it. That's a fair point. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe you'll feel it wasn't uh, totally the sale gone through. You can have it back. But uh, Tom Brady is back. You know, less than forty days after he announced his uh, retirement, and here he is going back in now for his uh, next season with Tampa Bay once again. He was at Old Trafford at the weekend. I was wondering if that was the Glazers buttering him up. It seems to have been the case. His son got Cristiano Ronaldo's jersey as well. Maybe that's the final push he needed uh, to go back to Tampa Bay. But I was just thinking in, in terms of retirement, gents. Like when you would have decided, I'm giving up intercounty. Was there actually any difficult periods in that, say, I won't re- define it only as 40 days, but in the period after you retired where you would have got the itch when lads were going back to train it or maybe the first match that Galway would have played after you left where you would have went, geez, I wish I was going back in here. Um, I, I, honestly, I'm, I'm going to say there wasn't because I was quite content in, in my decision at the time. Now, now you have to understand Tom Brady is coming off the back of another marquee season like where he got through nearly 5,000 yards and 50 touchdowns. So like he's he's operating at a level that he's still you know the primary player in his team and he's operating at a level that he could produce the same goods now as he produced twenty years ago. I was not that, I was not that. Do you know what I mean? So I was at a level whereby I had you know probably work had taken over, family had taken over, the body was was taken over. Let's say and it was time for the young guns, time for the young guns to keep going. You know, so I was quite content. And don't get me wrong, like when 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 uh, when I was talking to one of my my close friends, he says. When you know you want to retire, you'll know, right? And two, two of my friends, other lads around the country team as well with me, they were down doing a running session, one in, in December. And every year I get the itch to go with them. You know what I mean? Or I, I get the itch to do it myself. When I saw them run, I nearly got sick. You know, I said, no, I don't want to look at that. <laughs> that's, that's beyond me nowadays. I say, I want to do it in my own time. So I, said, is, I was quite content in my decision. But uh, yeah, Brady being back, it still hurts though that he left the Patriots. You know, I still can't get it over. It, you know, so we we move on from him now very fast and just go back to GA, right? Well, I'm not going to lie, James. When I, when I saw his retirement, right, and the nature of the statement that he put out, I genuinely thought one of these American things were going to happen, which is they often hand out like a ceremonial contract so that he would actually retire as a Patriot. I thought that was going to happen. That if he was going to retire, yeah. the Patriots would make him a Patriot for a day. And then he could officially yeah. announce his retirement afterwards. I which, thought something is, like that was going to happen. Which is regular. That's that's regular, right? And then when I saw his... Now, we're getting on to Tom Brady talk here now. But yeah. when, he, when he saw his retirement statement, I won't, I won't lie to you, I was I was pissed for a week. Because he didn't mention the Patriots once, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> like, I was pissed. I was I was actually angry with him for a week, you know? Um. So now that he's coming back, there's still there's still time. You know, there's still time that he'll retire a Patriot. That's when, as you can see, I'm wearing my, my Patriots t-shirt here, you know? So <laughs> he's still our guy, though. I don't care what anybody says. He's our guy. It's Johnny Sexton I feel for here, lads, because Johnny Sexton had just got away from the fact that everyone was mentioning the Tom Brady comparisons. And I think this is Stuart Lancaster's fault. I think he was the original one who introduced this idea that you know Johnny Sexton was watching Tom Brady and Tom Brady was an inspiration given his longevity. And then on the very week that Johnny Sexton announces after the Rugby World Cup, I'm done, I'm gone. Tom Brady's back playing again. So Johnny Sexton, no doubt before the Scotland game, is going to be hit with a Tom Brady question. He's probably thinking, I thought I got rid of this guy just yeah. a month ago. Um <laughs> Paul, when you retired, did you have any kind of second thoughts or were you very comfortable with your decision after you'd done it a bit like James there? Yeah, yeah, no, it's something, um, I suppose you, you couldn't buy it in terms of how happy I was. And I say that from a point of view that I think a fear of a player, like when I was playing, I always, every so often you think about it, you say, how do I leave this? Like, is it I'm enjoying this too much? How do I leave it? And, you know, the competitive edge and wanting to do it and you know, and you hear about players who leave it and they find a struggle when they do leave it. How do they fill the void and all these different things? But being perfectly honest, when I left it, I felt just a weight off my shoulders because you do kind of fret about it, you know. And in my final year with Kenny, you know, I was, I was hurling really well. Physically, I was more than capable of carrying on. Even now, I feel that, you know, physically, it's not that the body was falling apart by any means. I had no major injuries in my career. But what basically started happening, you know, I was just leaving training and felt that I wasn't in a good place in terms of just really enjoying it for carrying on. You know, I was performing, I was coming to training, you know, we train at seven o'clock, I'd, I'd be there at 10 to six and you'd be doing your preparation. So now I'd be there at 10 to six because once you hit 30, you kind of start, I'd start up to come in maybe 10 minutes earlier. But, you know, I was preparing really well, um, you know, didn't put any corners. And, you know, there was a few things that kind of ticked the box along the way. I started thinking about it, just told nobody really in the running 
to it in the final year. But after the Waterford match, I knew in the Waterford match, during the match, I said, right, this is me done because I knew when Brian Cody was looking up into the stand, it wasn't for me. And as Kilkenny were losing that match, I felt I had something to contribute. But I was kind of going, well, if the management don't feel that, it's a very tough place for a player if you continue going to the well to provide for this team. And in terms of provide an option for this team, but you're not going to be used. Well, then I think that's a sensible time to say, okay, this is my time to now exit stage left. So I remember going home, I told Conor Fogarty in the car, I said, listen, I think that's me done. And he was saying, look, just give it a few months. I did. I kind of met with Richie, Richie Hogan. Um, obviously, growing up hurling with Richie, and Richie's you know, a good lad to chat to. Chat with Richie, obviously chatted to my wife, Aileen. I kind of said, look, I'm going to give it its time. But once it starts coming back to that time of the year where lads are going to be called back in for a fitness test, I'll give it till then. And sure enough, lads are coming back in. And I was going, no, that's it now. And what was a good thing about it was, you know, once I chatted to Brian and I, I stood aside, like I said, it actually physically felt like there was a weight gone off because the decision had been made. And my mind then shifted to going, now I can do all the things I couldn't do before, where I can actually plan a summer holiday or I can go to my friend's wedding without going, God, will we be, will we be in Carton House that weekend? Or will, You know, all those thoughts suddenly disappeared. So for the thing of, like, let's say, the Tom Brady side of it, going back, Tom Brady has a great luxury of going back that he'll be offered his 800,000 contract, doesn't have a day job, has probably travelled the world and has his houses all over it. So... What he does when he steps away from football is a big question. But myself and James's thing is now we get to go and live when we're stepping away. So it's a it's, it's a good trade to have that. And for me, you know, I, I also got involved as well with let's say Kenny under 16s, which you know I didn't break that tie completely. Which for some players it is important to maybe break the tie, or for some other players it's good to do a gradual kind of step away. But I think for 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 any player is finding that that area that you are comfortable with. Um, for some players, that's going to the body finishes. For other players, it's a case of, you know what, I'm 27 years of age, I've done what I want to do, now I want to go travel the world. For any player, when they're making that decision to retire, it's deciding what's best for you. It doesn't matter what the player left or right you did when they left. What's comfortable with you? And I never got that itch. And not to say I'm happy with that, but I'm happy that I have no kind of, oh, what ifs, or maybe I should go back or anything. That's one thing I feel that you can't buy um, for any player. And it's a wish I, I would have on any player is that you don't walk away from it going, looking back at the closed door, as lads would say, going, oh, geez, you know, maybe I should do this or I should do that or could I stay going? For me, that wasn't a question. And I don't have the Tom Brady syndrome of going, maybe I want to go back, which is, it's for me, it's a good place to be. Yeah, and I think it depends as well, lads, on what you've achieved in the game. In the case of Brady, like he's just a, a crazy serial winner. So this guy, if he feels he's got something left in his legs and in his arm, he was always likely to try and go back and win another Super Bowl. This is a guy who's written all the records himself. He has nothing to prove to anybody. He's going back to try and just prove that he's the very best. I've kind of found it on the opposite end of the scale with some players who've had a U-turn when they were gone or when they were retired. I'm thinking of Niall McNamee here, who's back playing with the Offaly footballers at 36 right now because he heard things were going well in the camp two years ago had a conversation with John Mon, went back in, he didn't want to miss out on it because he hadn't had great days during his career. He's with a struggling team. Emlyn Mulligan was talking to Joe on off the ball when he went back in with Leitrim last year. Said similar. It was like, it looks like Andy Morn is going to have a good setup here. That Maybe this isn't a setup that I had when I was previously at Leitrim. And even if I can just do it for a year, I want to get a chance to actually be able to do this. So it's amazing how, I guess it's so independent. It's so, Jameson comes to this, probably dependent on the player's own circumstances as well that maybe if they feel there's just one more bite of the cherry, that's the reason they might have the U-turn. Yeah, like, like I suppose, in, like, Paul's instance, like, Paul has four Ireland's Paul, is it? Yeah. Or, like, Paul has four Ireland's, like, so, so in terms of achievements in the game, like, there's nothing more to achieve, you know, from, from your perspective as a lessons, right? Whereas I have won, you know, if I didn't have that one when Limerick beat us in 2020, you know, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, semi-final St. Croix Park, as I'm walking out, I'd be thinking, geez, I have to come back again and try again, you know what I mean? Because it nearly would feel like I don't know, justification for your efforts all throughout the years. You know what I mean? So, like, yeah. if you put in 14 or 15 years into a county set up, let's say, aiming towards Ireland, and you didn't achieve it, it's still, if you had, if the body would stack up, let's say, and you could move all the pieces around uh, off court, if you know what I mean, or off field, you'd, you'd go again. You know what I mean? But the fact that I had one, regardless if it was on the field play or not, and don't get me wrong, lost a couple too, but the fact that I had one, I could go away thinking, geez, yeah, I, I've given all I, I've given. You know what I mean? Like there's, there's, there's young people, let's say, who, who take my position and have the, no more than Paul's case, have the backup of the, of the management team, even though you'd feel like you were, you were probably in a better position at the time, you'd say, look, it's, it's time for me to step aside here. And I'm more than content in what, as I said, 
I achieved in the game. Obviously, when you contrast it in other counties like Paul, you know, it's just not the same. Numbers-wise, it's not the same. But what I, what I set out as a child to do, let's say, play for the senior team, win our Ireland, that was achieved. You know what I mean? Whether you go on and win seven or, win, or 10 All-Stars or whatever it is, that's just that's an irrelevant stat in my perspective. You just set out, win Ireland, get it, and now it's done. So that, uh, that was a big part. That was a big part. And if that void wasn't filled, I, I don't know the genuine answer, to be honest, Will. What would I have done? You know, that's why I, I, I have the height of respect for people who go back in, like Camogie, players, game football, everyone who go in and don't have the same, I suppose, don't have the same setup, but don't have the same luxury of competing for Ireland's year and year out, don't have the same professionalism setup, and they still go back in and still go back to the well and, and give what they can for the Jersey Day to say. I know it's very cliche to say, but uh, like it's it's admirable, to be honest. And I, I, again, I would be quite frank in analysing myself as a person. I don't know if I was in a county that wouldn't be challenged in Ireland, would I have given the same effort? Truthfully, I don't know. You know what I mean? Because I'm lucky, I suppose, in one sense, to be from Galway and we were challenging, that maybe contributed to me to keep going and keep going and you could get to play with generation players like the Kennings and the Dahi Brooks, etc. I don't know if I was from Leeds and Hurlers, like, would I be as big into Hurling? As, you know, no respect as, as I am. Do you know what I mean? That's just being honest. So that's why I have the highest respect for players who do that. Yeah, because, look, I suppose success is relative. If you grow up in Kilkenny or if you're a Kerry footballer, the expectation is almost there every year that you should be winning a medal and you should be going out with a huge medal collection. While in the case of you, James, where you guys had a few near misses and the 30 years were clocking up without a Lee McCarthy for Galway, you don't want to miss out and not be part of the panel that gets over the line. Same, yeah. I would think, with these Waterford hurlers. They're going to be reminded about the fact that they've had over half a century of pain with all Ireland finals that they've lost. That you're a great motivating factor. If you were a Waterford hurler right now, if you think about it, Paul, you wouldn't want to leave without an All-Ireland medal. You want to be on that panel that actually gets over the line. And that's the motivation if you're, say, playing for Waterford and you're going down to train every day. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and that's it. Like, you know, we've, we've covered a lot there in terms of saying, like, people's different perspective and players' different perspective on it. Like, for that Waterford team, um, particularly the group at the moment, you know, like, I mean, when you think of the other Waterford teams, let's say even in my life thing, having won all our medals and you know James said about it there about that you say let's say you have your all our medal and you can, you can walk away like I would have had a few reminders along the way that I kept reminding myself of in terms of keeping your not necessarily keeping your feet in the ground but being grateful for what you for what you've done like I won one all our medal let's say when I won my first one I remember reminding myself at the time going like I said Kim McGrath hasn't got an all our medal or John Milan for example and like these were absolutely incredible hurlers. So if you can't be grateful about, I'm not saying yeah, I'm talking about myself, if you can't be grateful now, let's say, even if it finishes tomorrow and you have your one other medal, if you can't be grateful about that, well, it's a, refle- it's, a it's a reflection of you because it's not a reflection of the team or the other medal or anything. You know, it's a question of at what stage are you going to be grateful for, for the career? So once I said I had one, I was going, that's one more than a lot of lads who are hugely, would have been hugely determined of all Ireland medals. So for this Watford team, like if I'm a Watford player going, having won an All-Ireland medal, lots of, you know, near misses and different things, never mind that, it could be on the team that eventually gets Watford over the line and very deservedly over the line to win an All-Ireland. Do I want to be a part of that? Jeez, I wouldn't miss it for the world. You know, it's so understandable. So for, if, if I was, let's say, if I was down in Watford now at the moment, um, and I was, you know, 33 years of age, to be honest, in that scenario, I would be going, do you know what, I'm going to stay at it here now because it's going to happen. It's, I, it could be this year, it could be next year. So, again, those are the circumstances. So, yeah, for the likes of those lads at Waterford, like, again, in one way, like you said, it, it is a pressure, but I think it's something maybe we haven't touched on that Liam Cannon has managed to somehow get into these lads. Of, because a lot of these lads have now lost, you know, all Ireland's and, you know, all Ireland's semi-finals and being close calls and different things. So now he's, I, I, I suppose, from a water point of view, he has a lot of players in that dressing room who say, listen, lads, we've, done, we've lost those ones. There's no crack in losing it. It can't be any worse than the pressure of winning. So let's go out here, take on this pressure, forget everything, we're going to go out and hurl. So whatever Liam, Liam, Liam Cannell has kind of done, he seems to have these lads in a position as well where they're, they're, they're coping with that pressure um, and maybe the expectation, I don't know what you want to call it, but there is... A little bit of pressure on them to win it. Uh, I don't even like saying pressure on it. There may be an expectation at this stage because so many positives are happening in Morford that the dynamic, let's say, as opposed to myself and James and our experience with, with Kenny and Galway, the dynamic in Morford is 
okay, you want to go and win your All Ireland, but you also have this little expectation that we've been so close over the last while. You're our greatest hope now for the next few years. You kind of have to deal with that as well. But look, for Watford, I think that they are very close. I think they know they're very close. And for any Watford player in that camp, if we're talking about retirements and stuff, it would be very hard for any Watford player to leave because they're within a hair's breadth, really, of winning All Ireland, you know. And I'm not saying it's this year, or next year, or whatever, but like where Watford are at the moment in the pecking order. They're not far off it. So if we're keeping it in the in, in the team of retirements or you know what way will players be? You see, the likes of Kevin Moore and stayed on for so long and unfortunately just couldn't stay on any longer. Um, it it's you know it, it certainly if I was in Watford, I wouldn't be retiring anytime soon. Right, you write down your five most valuable players. I know Scal already is his well planned before we chat about it. But James, I want to ask you about slitters because. These smart slitters are coming in. We've had the ball standardized after this group met up and uh, discussed the slitter. They're going to put a microchip into the ball for the under-20 championships, which means every ball that comes in ahead of a game is traceable, that the officials can check them all before they go in. You were a goalkeeper. I'm pretty sure there's goalkeepers across the country who are going to have a story about the fact that they had a few rogue balls that they used to keep in the goals behind. Or, you know, goalkeepers definitely back in the day used to have a bag of slitters and the ball would find its way back out or a lighter ball might get poked out for a puck out. Did you go in with any of that shenanigans when you were playing? <laughs> oh, Jesus. Will, I, I still do. Like, you can admit this now. There's no yeah. problem. Oh, I there's don't, no retrospective yeah. bans for this. Can I just say, like, whatever I say in this podcast, like, whatever I've done in my career and careers do, I don't care what people think about it, you know. <laughs> I genuinely don't. So I would have carried, if we were against the breeze, I would have carried no slitters, you know, <laughs> like, just, and they're like, their tricks. I remember we played a league game, a club league game one day, and uh, we were uh, against the breeze and like, no slitters, and the, the, the opposition team came down and <laughs> they handed me a couple of balls. When they walked away, I caught the balls and put them out over the fence to the far side, you know, on the sideline. <laughs> so when nobody was looking, you know, and people can question my ethics. I, I don't care. <laughs> That's what I mean. But like, yes, uh, there, there is shenanigans. Everyone tries it. Don't get me wrong. Um, I, I, you'd often have a poor enough ball if, if a 65 was given against G and he, he kind of the game was in the line and he wanted him to try and miss it. He'd throw it out to him. If there's a penalty, he'd throw something out to him and hope he, he grasps it. Doesn't work a lot of the time. Well, he's really sick, and if you give him a bad ball for penalty, he still scores it. You know, <laughs> he just gives he gives you the look. But uh, yeah, the chip with the ball. I look. If you go back in towards the, in in terms of technology, technology the way it has advanced in GA, I was very happy with the Hawkeye introduction. You know, because we we played a game against Kenny where and I still remember it, under the under the, the Cusick stand, Richie Power gets it off his left and strikes it over. The ball was wide, right? But it was given as a point. Do you know what I mean? Hundred percent. And uh, it, it, I was thinking, Jesus, Hawkeye came in the year after, right? And I was thinking, like, if only it was there at that point, wouldn't have stood. But regardless, Hawkeye was a great introduction. It didn't slow. It doesn't slow down the game at all in the sense that um, it's just it's too important. You know what I mean? So if a score is a score, or if it's not a score, the way that the game has been managed down the margin there, Hawkeye was so important. The slither, I'm not really sure. That's to be honest. I don't know why they've introduced that. Probably off the back of probably Brian Hogan and the catches he's had over the crossbar, I'd imagine, or even Owen Murphy in the uh, was it the semi final this year against Cork where he took one down? Was it against Cork or Wexford? I can't remember. So he took one down over and ended up in the net, you know, but it was given as a, a point. Probably that's the reason the ball has been introduced. Um, I just hope the quality of the ball is, is, is as good as it is at the moment and it's not kind of compromised in any way, shape, or form. Um, and I see, I know we saw an article, maybe it was a tweet with, with uh, Patrick Hogan about the colour. Um, again, I agree with him on the colour. I think the ball should have been left as white. You know, I, I would base a lot of our... I mean, look at the Americans, they don't get an awful lot wrong when it comes to sport. And there's a reason the baseball is white and there's a reason the golf ball is white, you know. And for it to change the, the colour is, I just don't agree with it. I'm, I was quite content with white. Perfect from an aesthetic perspective and even viewing the ball when you contrast it against green grass or a blue sky or whatever. So there's no reason to change that. But I'm all for technology. I'm all for introducing it when it needs to be introduced, you know. And I think the... The amount of instances we had with balls going wide and, and, and controversial calls, that's why Hawkeye was introduced. That's fine. But with regards to the couple of instances we had with Brian Hogan and Owen Murphy, I don't think it happens enough to warrant a chip in the ball. What happens if there's a technology malfunction? We saw at the start of Hawkeye and a big game is decided. So it'll be interesting to see how that transpires. Yeah, the standard slitter, by the way, from now on. So the mass has to be between 110 and 116 grams, uh, which formerly was a little bit wider. You could have it 120 previously. Uh, they've changed the rim height ever so slightly. 
Uh, so the rims now have to be a little bit smaller than previous. Now, this is one that's discussed all the time, lads, that the rims are getting too small and it's almost like a baseball because it's a bit more difficult with the bigger rim. Uh, but the rim height now will be 1.8 to 2.6 millimetres, which is standardised and the width is staying the same as previous. So it can go that's up small. to 5.4. But realistically, most of the have been made are far closer to three than they are to five. But um, with the yellow ball, Paul, do you care about whether it's yellow or whether it's white? Like Patrick Horgan seemed quite genuine in his belief that the ball should be staying whiter. Yeah, well, I'd agree with Patrick Horgan. Like I, I say it kind of, not to be talking on both sides of my mouth here now, but mm. like in, in one way, kind of a non-issue, it's yellow ball. But like the traditionalist in me, like and maybe the cynic in me was saying, well, what's the need? Again, like James is saying, what's the need? Like I wasn't running around going... I can't see the ball here. You need to change the colour. And I saw a statement as well saying that, you know, um, I think it was the professor who brought it in and said that, uh, you know, all the players struggle to see the ball and so on and that the contrast in their eyes that they can't see it. That's why tennis introduced the yellow ball and so on years ago. But I, who did you survey for this? Because, you know, often we get surveys as a, as a player in the GPA or through the GA to survey what you feel about this. I don't ever remember in my time seeing... Oh, Jesus, yeah, yeah, there's a big need here to fill out a survey and say that I can't see the ball. It was never a thing, do you know? So that part of me, not so much the ball turning yellow, it's the part of me of the thought process behind it saying, why are we turning it yellow? For me, again, if I'm very cynical, I would say this thing of, in, in, in most jobs, we get yearly reports and we're, we're, we have to show what we did for the year. And I think there might be something here. Someone said, look, we introduced the yellow ball. Isn't it fantastic? <laughs> now, that's very cynical out of me and I appreciate that. But again, this yellow ball just kind of came onto the scene and I think it's part I agree with Patrick Corgan I actually rather just looking at a white ball and you might say look lads there's no story here give it up but I rather the traditional thing of looking at the white ball um, and so yeah look again it's not that it's going to drastically change the landscape of it but again I just go back to the whole thing of maybe the bit of the cynic in me came out and kind of said who who asked for this and why did it introduce and I just think there was maybe someone the good idea brigade might have been out saying listen introduce yellow ball this would be fantastic and we can we can show what we're after doing but maybe i'm wrong maybe i don't know enough about it but i'd agree with patrick Corgan. i prefer the white ball yeah, well, I remember, look, there was arguments, lads, a few years ago when the yellow balls were first being trialled that apparently it was easier to see the yellow ball when it was under lights and now there are more games under floodlights than there would have been previously. But genuinely, from going to games, I don't see any tangible difference between seeing a white ball with floodlights or a yellow ball. I don't know. James, is your experience any different playing? I mean, you would have played some games under lights. Never. When the ball goes up in the air under lights, you cannot see the colour. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like... Forget about the colour. Like, I mean, what Paul said about your man saying it's for the older players. Did you ever hear such? Uh, maybe you see the odd picture of a 55 year old lad in a club playing junior B. You know, like that maybe it's relevant then. But in today's game, forget about that. That's just a stupid, a stupid comment, throwaway comment if you ask me. You can't tell the difference. You know, I, I think the white ball is excellent. And I, I always think along the grass, it's, it's, it, it stands out so much along the grass. And I keep referring back, like if, if, it, if it looks right, right, sounds right, it's generally right. You know, so the white ball was nothing wrong with it. There was no issue brought by, uh, to my memory now, you, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but there was no issue brought by a player or by a manager or any coach or anyone in kind of, a, I suppose, a hierarchy position in Coral Park to, to draw a complaint about the white ball. I can't remember anyone saying the white ball is a problem. We need to look at this. You know, I can remember the issue about Hawkeye and about introducing technology for that, for that reason, but the white ball was never put in question, ever. So I don't know why they actually changed it. And I agree with Paul wholeheartedly. It was a job for the boys. You know, let's let's look at something to think we do introduce a bit of a, a more modern or I don't know, look on the game and, and bring in a, a yellow ball and then throw the reason that it's easier to see in television. My God, like you know, what does it matter? Like it's just it's so irrelevant. You know what I mean? Um, but look at is it here to stay? It probably is. You know what I mean? They won't take the opinion of a couple of ex hurlers and current hurlers over the opinion of the boys, you know. So <laughs> Let's get used to it. Well, look, Patrick Horgan will not have to shush either of you guys if he scores a goal at Wexford Park this weekend uh, over your opinions on white setters. He might well be angry if he's not in the top five hurlers, most valuable players in the country, though. You both picked them. So, Paul, I'm going to give you a first shout. Um, Good. I, Good. <laughs> to define, because James is going to annoy people, I know already. It's the way he's sitting back, I can tell by his body language. Yeah. Look, yeah. Can, I, can I just say, right, okay, look, at this all started down in, 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 a, in the WhatsApp group, right? And... <laughs> I suppose I threw up my top 10 hurdlers and I didn't stipulate 
how I chose them. So it created a small <laughs> bit of different discontentment in the Kilkenny Brigade here, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so I did it on a transfer market value. That was the, the way I said, right? So I said, if you were taking, you see them on Twitter all the time with soccer players, you know, or who's the most valuable player? And you always see the likes of Mbappe is up there because he's young and whatever. So that's what I'm saying. So Paul, the floor is yours, okay? <laughs> Where you go. There's, there's more terms and conditions with your players now than there is getting the mortgage <laughs> to tell you. So yeah, no, look, my attitude to this was just going, you could, you could look at this, uh, I suppose, 10 different ways. You could look at league form, you could look at from last year, you could look at whatever. I basically looked at it. If I'm going out, I pick 15 players tomorrow. Who are the first five uh, I'm, I'm putting on the team? Um, I think it's, it's, it's an obvious number one. Keen Lynch is number one um, for what he brings to the team. Not just in terms of scoring and the things, but just playmaker, centre forward, you put him in, you get through a huge amount of ball. And I don't think any, anyone would argue that Keane Lynch is, is the best player in the country at the moment. After that, I've gone close to home. I've gone for TJ. Um, I know he's probably not even in your five, James, from the texts you were sending me there during the week. But again, you look at what TJ did in the club championship, a lad who's carrying an injury, a groin injury, and he goes in. You know, St. Thomas will tell you what he's able to do in the last few minutes. He'll produce that bit of magic. And... Again, okay, TJ is up around 34. Maybe I think he's going to be 35 this year. But like TJ is just performing. It's it's almost like Ronaldo getting a hat-trick the weekend. You can't really explain. Other players can't do it, but TJ can do it. And for what TJ brings to a game, never mind the great scores he gets, like his aerial ability, his movement and everything. In number three then, I've gone for Tony Kelly because I just think the wizardry of what Tony Kelly does in terms of a team that isn't perform to the standard what he brings to games I think you put Tony Kelly into any team and it's just you know you have like James is saying you, your energy you have your skill he's just capable of doing I, I keep saying this Royal Rover stuff he just does this incredible stuff so Tony Kelly is number three for me number four <laughs> uh, some lads would argue I'm going to put Garot Hegarty in number four again like you you look at it after the All-Ireland last year and lads were just saying what he can do and the, the force of nature he is in the open space Pro Park he just covers ground and he barrels through the fences and he takes hardship. Okay, he gives a bit of hardship as well, but I'd be, I'd be putting Garot Hegarty there. And then number five, I would actually have Jamie Barron number five. The reason I say it is Jamie Barron last year, okay, the year didn't finish the way he wanted, but if you want to draw comparisons against other sports, there's your N'Golo Kante there. For me anyway, like Jamie Barron, what he gets through is, is unbelievable. I don't know, is there another player that covers as much ground? I'm sure there's someone that will come out with a statistic when Watford are going well, like Jamie Barron is going well, generally he's the fulcrum there. I know we talk of Tiger Burke and Austin Leeson's, but I know I said N'Golo Kante there. There are very few players who can do what Jamie Barron does in the pitch. And, and similar to, like I said, that with, with, with N'Golo Kante, is that very few players can replicate that and who does the job so perfectly. Just runs around the pitch, gets the fix, gets the blocks, pops up with three scores, but just gets through a huge amount of work. So they're, they're my five. And I'm open for anyone in this forum or on, or on YouTube to tackle me. So I'll go back through them again. Keen Lynch one, TJ two, Tony Kelly three, Garot Hegarty four, and Jamie Barron five. And I like to say as well, a nice little mix there, James. So you can explain yourself now what you were talking about. Oh, I'm under pressure now, this. <laughs> I'm under pressure. I can just see the comments now on YouTube and Twitter coming at me saying, where did I get my players, you know? But I have to say... I'm just thinking transfer market value, right? And I'm thinking of age. So I may have put a little cap on the, and I said, right, he's maybe gone a bit over the age, but I see here now he's only two years older than three of my players here, okay? So <laughs> <laughs> forgive me. Number one, uh, again, me and Paul are agreed to this one. Um, it's Keen Lynch. What Paul said, I just reiterate that again. Um, exceptional player, generational talent. Probably when he finished his career, Goudin was one of the best players ever played the game. I think that's a fair statement. I don't think I'm over-exaggerating that. And uh, when you just look at his influence over a team, even when he's being marshaled or being marked, he, he, he requires so much, atten- so much attention and focus off the opposition. So when he doesn't play well, he's still, he's still doing a job. You know what I mean? That, and for me, if a player, a player, when he's a great day, it's easy to call a player a good player on his great day. But even on the, the days he's not going so good or things aren't clicking from, if he's still having an influence in other ways, that's, that, for me, that's a, that's a guy that deserves to be number one. Uh, number two, I have Kyle Hayes. Uh, 24 years of age. So Keane Keen is 26. Kyle Hayes is 24 years of age. Um, I just think where he's going. To, what's his ceiling? You know, a guy who can win in Ireland, in Ireland and win a man the match at centre forward, then come back and get an all star and you know be as influential for him, his team at wing back. You know, it just it, it screams of kind of the Tommy Walsh type person who can play anywhere and is just 
a fulcrum of the, of, of the Limerick team and Alan was uh, were keen. Number three, uh, slightly biased here, right? Just because I can see what the, what the lad can do at Cahill Manion. If you're any team in the country, whether it be any time in a style, kind of style of hurling, any kind of pattern of play or game plan you're trying to introduce, Cahill Manion will fit into them all. He's a machine of a runner. Uh, he's a fitness freak. Uh, he's very strong, two sides, catches the ball, takes side end threes. He can do it all. Um, and just like he's, as I said, I've seen it firsthand. He's an exceptional talent. And I can say hand on heart here, when we're poking before training and he's taking shots in the goal, I can never read him. He scores them all. You know, that's probably, it. <laughs> he's just a brilliant stick man. He's like an artist of a hurler. Very, very similar to, to a keen type person as well. Right. Uh, number four, I have Garrett Chegarty. Uh, similar to what Paul was saying, again, a behemoth of a man. He kind of seems to be transformed that Limerick uh, forward unit when he first got introduced and just brings so much power, so much pace. I think for Limerick to go forward and win in Ireland, multiple Ireland, they need Garrett Chegarty to be as penetrative as, 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 as he is, or he has been, should I say. Probably a touch off form at the minute, but that will come for a guy of his quality. And again, if you're any manager and you had 100 million to spare in a transfer market, you'd be spending on Garrett Chegarty. And the last one, I, I love this lad. Um, I just love watching him. When he's going well, my God, he goes well. <laughs> Paul is smiling there. I have Ozzy Gleeson, right? Ozzy Gleeson's 27 this year. I love watching Ozzy Gleeson. I, just, I have an image of, in my head of that man, the way he played against E. Paul in, um, will it be 17 or 18? Uh, well, I'd say he established performance in 16. 16, 16, sorry, yeah. yeah. Um, where he, I think he was, did he get hurt of the year that year? Maybe I'm... He got hurt of the year that year, 2016. Yeah, yeah. and I just... That, that, I know, and I know, don't get me wrong, that performance is, is five and a half, six years ago, right? But that was just extreme quality. And I, every time I watched him, I said, he's capable of this. You know, he just needs the right day or something, the right way to click for him. And he's capable of just doing so much, you know, and like, love the sidelines, love the freeze, love the high catches, love the big scores, love the blind shooting. I just like him a lot. So, and again, 27 years of age. So I have, a, I have an under 27 team here. Uh, so it's <laughs> Keen Lynch is number one. Kyle Hayes is number two. I have Cahill at number three, Fegarty at number four, and Ozzy at number five. Right. Well, I've been scribbling down your top fives. It's up to the viewers and listeners now to come back and actually uh, take issue with this list. But a couple of things that jump out to mind here, Paul. There are two defensive players technically here. You mentioned what Jamie Barham will do as a, a holding midfielder type who will still get forward. And Kyle Hayes, who's a converted forward that's playing as a wing back. I got onto James's list as well. It's very forward heavy. Is that the nature of where you're saying value is in forwards? Yeah, like I suppose you're not saying the value is in forwards. Being a defender, I, I, I don't think I'd be biased in that. Like, I mean, straight away, you're thinking Sean Finn, you're talking Do- thinking Dahi Burke, you're thinking of these lads, you know, Connor Prunty, you're thinking, you know, there's there's lots of lads there. But like speaking from the corner back here, the full back brigade, like there's, I'm looking at those players simply off the, off, off, off the basis of what they bring to a team, you know. Keen Lynch sews it all together. You know, I'm thinking similar enough with, with Tony Kelly, Jamie Barron, the same. There are very few players can do what those lads do. That's what I'm just basically saying. Not to say that, like, there are very few players can do what Sean Finn can do as well, but a lot of lads will make a fair stab at it. There's a lot of lads who can kind of, to a certain extent, fill that position. But is there a lot of lads who can go out and do what TJ does and score 112 regularly? You know, let's say, okay, I know a lot of that will be built up with freeze and different things, but... You know, who'll go out and do the things that they're able to do. It's not, can anyone do what Tony Kelly can do? Tony Kelly is really the only lad who can do that. So really, when I was looking at it, that's the thing, you know. Um, the, the likes of the Sean Finns of this world, absolutely incredible players, no doubt about it, and the best in their position. But I suppose when you're, when you're hamstrung with only five lads, you're, I suppose you're thinking of five lads who bring something to a team that very few other players can do. And that's what I'm looking at. Like, I, t- I can't think of anyone who does what Jamie Barron does better. I can't think of anyone. No one does what Tony Kelly does. But similarly enough, Tony Kelly doesn't do what TJ does. Do you know what I mean? So what I'm looking at, I'm looking at from that point of view, they're, they're, they're these kind of rogue lads who are completely able to do their own thing. They'll be targeted in every game, but still manage to come out performing the exact same way, you know. So it is forward heavy, uh, and, 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 and I can say that. But if I was sitting here as a forward, you could hop off me, but I'm a defender. So I don't think there can be much argument there. Right, James. Where's Patrick Horgan? Neither of you have him on the list. I have a free take. I have, I have plenty of last take free. He's there. Not, not to, that's yeah. Patrick Horgan's <laughs> job. But like, again, Patrick Horgan, look, again, I marked him several times. I think he scored. I think he one day in Nolan Park, he came away with about eight or nine points off me. Someone will come back and beat me the same as probably 11 points. 
But again, like a savage player, absolutely no doubt about it. The thing about picking the top five, like James takes me a hip of honourable mentions as if I asked for them the other day. I didn't even ask for them, but he was even <laughs> finding it hard to stick to his five players. There's so many lads you could put in there. And like, no, like, you know, Patrick Hogan was was a hair's breadth away from getting on that. And I don't think he's going to care what I think of, of my top five players. But again, it's such a hard thing. There's, there's another, I guarantee there's another five players who aren't far off people inside that. Like that, James said, Ozzy Deason. I thought about Ozzy as well. And again, a lad who's capable of incredible things, but um, there's 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 so many players there. Connor Whelan's another fella that is just a millimetre away. Park Welch, another fella. So you have to kind of draw the line somewhere, and you have to be a little bit strict. Uh, yeah, but 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 definitely, if I had a top ten, Patrick Horgan, without doubt, obviously he's in that. And look, if you were to ask me next week, I could change it. If Patrick Horgan could be in it again, you know. Hmm. Well, James, I'm looking at your honourable mentions, so let's give you a chance to go through them here, because in fairness to you, you had picked 10 and you picked honourable mentions as well. So you've gone quite deep into a, an almost a hurling depth chart when you sent the first text about this. <laughs> yeah, yeah like I, I had this in my notes for about six weeks. You know, I, I've been waiting for this topic to come up, but I had, I had to produce it to you guys. Right? <laughs> but I, I, while, while Paul was talking, I went off there and I called the guy's ages. Paul's average age of his, of his team is 20 pound, 29 pound four years, right? And my age is 26.1 years. So I think over 70 minutes extra time, we'll take them. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take them. A, I said, that's, that's a very tenuous argument you have there now. The average age. A lot can happen in those three years, is it, James? No, I know what you mean. <laughs> I, I, think, um, I think what obviously Paul has gone with, with obviously present tense to a certain extent, obviously, and, and the influence they can have over team regardless of age, right? I've gone more towards obviously present tense as well, but with longevity and, and put into play. My honour mentions, do you want to talk them out? Why not? I'm just looking at them here, what? so throw them out there. There's a few, in fairness, there's a few young hurlers on this as well, including a few breakthrough players this year. Like James, yeah, so if, this, if this serves for nothing else, it'll just serve to prove to people what you'll be texting us during the week, so like, just, you might as well fire away. That's no offence to you, James. <laughs> <laughs> not that I have the time, or anything like it. Really, I'm just very interested in this but, uh, so my honor, so I have to go through the rest of my ten, though. You know, because the, someone, the floor is all someone, yours here. Work away. Yeah, this, someone, this, this is all you. This is all yes, you. someone's going to rock into the comments, <laughs> right, and, and tear me a new one if I if I forget, guys, right? So I had obviously to finish out my ten. I had uh, Connor Wheel, Sean Finn, Rory O'Connor, Parik Walsh, Sean Cody. That's fair. Again, when you think about, it, I keep saying the age and what they produce over time, right? Now, honorable <laughs> mentions. So I've Mark Coleman. Cahill O'Neill, the reason he's in there is because I've been just really impressed with you know when you look at a player and you, you watch him and you can say that guy, look, he's got all the tangibles you know, he looks like a really silky player, a lovely hurler, you know what I mean, and that after a couple of years he's going to just turn into an absolute beast for that team. Cahill O'Neill just screams that to me, he's got everything size two sides, carries himself fierce well, great skill, good finisher, I'm thinking geez, where's that guy going to be in, in two, three years time that's why he's on the list, you know um, I have Adrian Mullen, Owen O'Donnell Connor Prunty, Stephen Bennett, and Aaron Galland. So that's that's a bit of thought, yeah. You know, so go on, rip me a new one there, Paul, if you want. <laughs> I wasn't going to rip you a new one, but there's very few players left in the inter county scene now after your top 10, your honorable mentions, or uh, all these different merits you're going to award to that. <laughs> no, no, fair play, yeah. fair play. You put a lot of thought into it. I don't know what you were close to. Or much is done with there. Did he not yeah. even get an honorable mention? He didn't. There's too many Kilkenny lads in this to see. Jesus, you, uh, the greatest, <laughs> one of the greatest goalkeepers of all time can't even make it inside your top 20. Well, in, in my view, right, in my view, and again, this sounds like a completely unrealistic argument, Owen Murphy is the greatest goalkeeper I've ever seen. You know, for, for me, right? But I'm just talking transfer markets. You look at transfers yeah. in soccer and the goalies don't, enough, don't, yeah, yeah. don't yeah. warrant 150 million, 200 million, no, for our goalies. You know. <laughs> but I have what? I have one. I've more than, I have four kilos in there. I'm not arguing that. Enough. <laughs> I've only two bowlers. <laughs> you do realise the YouTube uh, title tomorrow is going to be TJ Reid can't make Skettle's top 18 hurlers in the country. That's yeah, but you have to, you you have to stipulate. Today. You have to stipulate the terms in which I chose the list. You know what I mean? Otherwise, I, I could be sacked off the podcast. You know? <laughs> we're, we're well aware of your terms, James. But I think it's, it's, it's hard to stand over that now. It's all, it's, all, it's all about clicks. You think people aren't going to click in if they see TJ Reid's outside the top 20 hurlers in the country. Hello, <laughs> hello, viewer. Credibility, drain, gone. Yeah. No, I don't care. I'm sticking to it. 
Right. But look, let, let everyone else debate that. You can hit us up at off the ball if you want to send us a tweet about that. Or probably the handiest thing to do is just to leave a comment on the YouTube and we can go through it. Because we have a few comments in uh, from the YouTube that I want to have a look at from last week just to kind of throw back at you. Um, Paul, I'll give you a first one this because it was one of your comments that was directly uh, spoken about here. Um, nine minutes into the podcast this week, Paul advocates in a roundabout way for flopping simulation cheating. Toughest field game in the world, I thought they said about hurling. It's been creeping in, simulation that is. I think it's commonplace at this stage. Not sure, Paul, exactly how commonplace it is, but it is happening a bit. And it's been discussed a lot more that a player will go down now to make sure that they get a free or a player will go down, particularly if there's an incident where potentially there could be a card. I don't know about creeping in, but it's definitely there in the game, isn't it? It is, yeah. And, and you know, referring back to that comment, like I didn't advocate for it. And if you go back and listen to what I said, what I said was merely pointing out the fact that players are doing that now. I'm not saying that players should be doing it. I'd be the complete opposite. I'd be all for players standing up and not selling it. And, you know, we, we saw it, let's say, in the leash Antrim match where the leash player shook the Antrim player. The Antrim player stayed standing. The leash player still got sent off. But the Antrim player, for, for all his, you know, for his merit, stayed standing. So in that instant, I didn't say that I'm advocating for it. I just said that we are seeing it. For example, you know, let's say with Aaron Galan, you know, the clearful pack, he went down, not saying selling it. I, I don't think it was, you know, but he, he, I don't think he necessarily had to go down. But we are seeing it creeping in. We're seeing it creeping in because players know that referees are under pressure to get each each decision correct. If a player stays standing, he actually probably does the referee a favour in terms of if he doesn't send them off, the referee goes, ah, it wasn't a bad slap. So players are going down. I'm not advocating for it at all. But I think if you're watching over any weekend over the course of games, you'll see players going down what I would determine as soft. In, in, in a certain regard, I don't, I wouldn't call it cheating. I'd call, call it probably a bit of gamesmanship that they're just going down, selling it small bit to referee and just, I suppose, making, making the referee's job that bit harder not to send off someone or not to give someone a book. And that's really what it is. So I'm by no means advocating for it. What I'm just saying is that we are seeing it and it's just pointing out the fact that this is what players are doing. I don't think it's gotten to the level of the diving and cynicalness really of it. Players are in these instances, I think, you know, physically getting hit. But like we said, it just goes back to that point. They're selling it a small bit more. Um, and it's just, I think it's evident across the game. I think there's very little people would argue with that at the moment. That certainly where it is now, it wasn't where it was 10 years ago. So at the moment, my point being in that instance is that we are see- seeing a few players selling it. But we are seeing players getting hit fairly hard and just finally going down. And we are seeing players going down and getting up straight away as best they can but I think very few people would argue with you that we we aren't seeing it at the moment in the game because we are seeing it yeah and look maybe as it goes on the hand pass right now is the hot topic that everyone's talking about and the referees clamp it down it like they never did before as this year goes on, you could well see some referees producing yellow cards when they see acts of simulation or uh, potentially things being overplayed. Uh, the next two comments, which I'm going to read out, actually, I'll give them to you, James, because we're at the moment on a week where there was no hurling on the weekend before. We're running as our longest podcast possible. Only the three of us could possibly do that. But um, Patrick Coleman arguing Limerick right now behind Cork, Wexford, Waterford and Kilkenny could struggle to get out of Munster. And also uh, Darren Doar saying amazing in the championship in Munster, four or five games to win Munster this year. Uh, championship games, timing is everything uh, regards getting players in the right place. The thing about this is, like, Munster is going to be so cutthroat, James, when we get back to this uh, round-robin system again, because yeah. like, not to throw anyone off the scent when it comes to Paul's County and Kilkenny, they've got Westmead and Leash in the first couple of weeks. So in a way, Kilkenny should be able to find their way into the championship before the break and then play their more difficult games after that. But you go into Munster, and we were talking about the first-round fixtures, like Cork and Limerick on the open weekend. It's going to be an absolute killer to try and get out of that province this year with the way the teams are going. Yeah, and like if you go back to the like last year's structure or the structure of, of history, let's say if the team gets beaten in their first round or second round, they've always had the qualifier route where they can go into a an easier route into a quarter final, you could say. Whereas this doesn't happen, you know, like like three teams are going to come out of Munster, three teams are going to Leinster. So that that Munster championship is an absolute dogfight. At at present moment, you're probably talking that when when the teams get flying and they get up and going, and say you're talking three out of the best, probably four in the best five at the minute. You know what I mean? Four of the top five countries that are. Are in Munster, so one is going to get knocked out before they even get to a qualifying stage to Ireland. You know, and that's look at it's tough shit. You know, <laughs> that's, that's just the way it is. Like that's the structure of the championship. So be it. You know, and my my attitude is always this: very simply put, if you're good enough, you'll come through. If you're not good enough, so be it. They've, they've all got. I think uh, is it five games they've got? 
So they have enough opportunities uh, home and away to come to come to the come to the top, you know. And like I'll tell you, first time in 20, 2019, we weren't good enough. Um, at the time, so we didn't qualify. We came fourth after coming off the back of an Ireland win, an Ireland loss, and then we didn't qualify out the group the following year. And that was just we weren't good enough, you know. I will say maybe Kikini and Wexford decided to go draw each other on the last day to <laughs> knock us out, you know. <laughs> but, <laughs> we'll see, but. You know, my point is, like, the fact of the matter, if you're good enough to come through to the top, you know, or in, in the top three, it's you're good enough. Destiny's in your own hands. So, yes, the, the Munster Championship is is uh, it's it's sacred down there, and you know, I think that some people, I, I actually, I do believe some people in Munster carry the Munster Championship as more important than, than the aren't. Honest to God, it's just because the, min, the minute you mention it, you know, people get very very sensitive down there. If there's a talk about restructuring or introducing one of their own counties, a Munster county. You know, it gets a bit quite heavy. I want the end of the county line up and thinking what, what I mean. Well, look, Paul, I don't think it's any coincidence that Ulster was the biggest fight back about football provincials maybe being restructured, and Munster would definitely argue hugely against the hurling championship being affected there. Understandably, because they're both good products. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and again, like as you said it there, the teams that go into Leinster view, I suppose they're running the championship a little bit different than the than the Munster has because as both of you are saying there, it's a dogfight in the Munster to get out of it. Whereas you can find your feet, let's say Kenny's running at the moment, they can, they can afford to find their feet going in, in into a Leinster Championship. But, you know, show me the team that can afford to find their feet going into a Munster Championship, they can't. Um, so again, w- w- what I think, if we're, if we're talking about this league as well, that there's a very short turnaround time, the Kenny possibly do have let's say, one of the more desirable routes at the moment in that they have that little bit of a gap that will allow uh, a small bit of, a suppose, steadying the ship going into championship and time to prepare. Whereas a lot of teams coming into Munster, don't, you, like, you have to hit the ground running and you have to perform. And that thing of just even getting out of Munster in itself is, is a great achievement because it's, it, it's exactly where you want it to be. It's so competitive at the moment. Now, again, the introduction of Galway into Leinster, that was a great addition for what it's done for the Leinster Championship because the Leinster Championship did become a bit of a dead rubber for so many years. And now we've seen, like, you know, we re- we have four teams really going hard for Leinster now at the moment, which is a fantastic place to be. So, like, each province, because of, look, again, if we went to more of a Champions League style and we're able to balance it out each year, or like we said, an NFL style where we can balance out the teams against each other. Well, again, we'd see, I suppose, a more spread of games and more competition and different things. But because we have the format we have of the provinces have to go against each other, and the same for the football, that, let's say in Munster, you have your, your, well, I suppose Tipperary would argue against it that they won the Munster Championship a few years ago in the football, but that you really have your two, your Kerry and your Cork going, that they have to do something there to really get the, the, the competition back going. You know, in Leinster and Munster, we, we do have a fairly good situation going, but we have to do work with the hand we're dealt in terms of this is the structure that we've traditionally stayed with. This is what we have to do. So as a result, we have to bring the rest of the teams along with it in Leinster. But Munster is, like James said, there's a huge badge of honour in Munster. And rightfully so, because it's, it's in terms of across the provinces, without doubt, it's the most competitive. Um, it's the, it, 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 the most likely All-Ireland champion is going to come out of, out of Munster. So, you know, realistically... It is worn with a badge of honour, but like we said at the start there, can Kenny have a nice little route into, into Leinster? They can afford to find their feet, but no team in Munster can afford to do that. Yeah, looking forward to it already. Uh, again, I can't reiterate enough the championship is going to come around. I was doing the diary planner for April, and there's a run of championship games between April and May, which is going to determine so much of the summer. It'll be very weird when we're kind of preconditioned as May being almost a starting point for the championship that a lot's going to be decided with the championship format, even by the time we get to the first weekend of May. Lads, it's been great chatting to you. Looking forward to next week when we get a chance to uh, look back in the last round of the regular section of the league and towards the semi final in a couple of weeks' time. So, thanks, Will.